Since Christ has given everything to us, we understand that now he owns all of us. He paid the price for our sin so that we could come to know him in a, in a life-changing way. So we take a time every Sunday to say to him, we love you, we appreciate you, we, get, we want to show you that we want to give back to you the things that you've given to us. So at this time, we're going to take an offering. If you're visiting here with us and you, you'd like to contribute, we'd sure welcome you to do that. But what we really want you to do if you're a visitor here is just receive something from God. I know that, that a lot of times we go to church and it feels like all they want is our money. All they want is for us to do something for them. We don't want that. We want instead for those who want to give back as an act of worship to him to freely do that. But if you're not quite there yet, that's okay. That's okay. We just want you to receive. Would the ushers come forward and I'll pray over the offering. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you for the new life you give each and every one of us, at least the opportunity to have that new life. Father, I pray that you would work in us, that you'd speak to us. For those of us who have questions, I pray that you would answer those questions. For those of us who don't buy it right now, I pray that you'll give them something to consider that would make them wonder if maybe there might be some truth here. And for those of us who love you with everything we have, Father, may our lives reflect it as we give back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. He has risen. He has risen Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 says this. Now we look inside and what we see is that anyone united with Messiah gets a fresh start. Is created new. The old life is gone. A new life burgeons. Look at it. All this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationship with each other. So the life change that happens in me that reconciles me to him should also reconcile me to anyone else that I have had issues with, anyone else that I have had struggles with. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. Jesus' resurrection is not just about giving me eternal life and a fire insurance policy. Jesus' resurrection from the dead is about changing me and changing you so that not only am I reconciled to God, but I'm reconciled with you and we become a community of reconciliation. He is changing the world through the resurrection one person at a time. Have you experienced that sort of life change? 
I think that's the question that the resurrection throws in our face every year as we celebrate it. Am I experiencing? Are people around me experiencing resurrection life in me? Have I been changed? Am I being changed? Paul says it this way. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he's doing. We are Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and to enter into God's work of making things right between them. You ever thought about that as the reason Christ came and rose from the dead? I mean, we we know that it's to give us new life, but it's not just supposed to stop there. That is the starting point. And as we start this race, running out of the starting blocks, it's supposed to be a race that we run with other people, reconciling us to them. We're speaking for Christ now, Paul says. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. How, you ask? In Christ, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so that he could put right, put us right with God. He took our sins, laid them on Christ so that we could experience the righteousness of God through our faith in what Jesus did for us. And when he comes into our lives, our lives are supposed to be different. So I want to kind of give you a little bit of a challenge. Do the people around you know that Jesus rose from the dead? How would they know it, you might ask? Because my life is, your life is different, my life is different. Do they see the resurrection power active and vitally effective in my life and in your life? Do they see something different? Maybe this Easter, maybe God would be challenging you to get serious about your faith, to push in to the word of God, to get serious about being in church on a regular basis, maybe gathering with a small group in a home. We call those life groups. Because life change should be taking place for you and those around you should see it and want some of that. They should be saying, you know, you got something I don't have. And I want that. The resurrection is about changing the world one person at a time because I think the greatest, more, most powerful evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is a changed life. If your life is not different, if my life is not different, if this church community is not different, then we are plugged into the wrong power source. Jesus came to change us completely. Leaving a lively discussion with some of his closest friends, Billy Graham went off into the woods with his Bible. In, uh, in his book, The Case for Faith, Lee Strobel tells something of this story. In a conversation that took place between Billy Graham and another man named Charles Templeton. Charles Templeton was... Uh, by, by many people's assessment, a better, more gifted communicator than Billy Graham could hope to be. But Charles Templeton would walk away from his faith. He would become a celebrated agnostic, uh, a commentator in, in Canada, well known for his beliefs um, after he rejected his Christian faith. But here's some of the dialogue that took place between Templeton and Billy Graham. Billy, you're 50 years out of date, he argued. People no longer accept the Bible as being inspired the way you do. Your faith is too simple. Templeton seemed to be winning the tug of war. If I was not exactly doubtful, Graham would recall, I was certainly disturbed. He knew that if he could not trust the Bible, he could not go on. 
the Los Angeles crusade, the event that would open the door for Graham's worldwide ministry was hanging in the balance. Graham searched the scriptures for for answers. He prayed, he pondered. Finally, in a heavy-hearted walk in the moonlit San Bernardino Mountains, everything came to a climax. Gripping a Bible, Graham dropped to his knees and confessed he couldn't answer some of the philosophical and psychological questions that Templeton and others were raising. I was trying to be on level with God, but something remained unspoken, he wrote. At last, the Holy Spirit freed me to say it. Father, I am going to accept this as your word by faith. I'm going to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and doubts. I will believe this to be your inspired word. Rising from his knees, tears in his eyes, Graham said he sensed the power of God as he hadn't felt in many months. Now here's the important part. Not all my questions were answered, but a major bridge had been crossed. He said, in my heart and mind, I knew a spiritual battle in my soul had been fought and won. For Graham, it was a pivotal moment. For Templeton, though, it was a bitterly disappointing turn of events. He committed intellectual suicide by closing his mind, Templeton declared. The emotion he felt most toward his friend was pity. Now on different paths, their lives began to diverge. Billy Graham's life played out for the public to see. Recently dying, and all the things that were read, uh, written about him, even one, one guy who set out to, to show Billy Graham as a charlatan became a believer because as he examined his life, he said, there's no one that, I can, that I've ever met who does everything they can to live the way God wants them to. And it wasn't because Billy Graham was a great person It was because Billy Graham put his faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus continued to change him and make him a different person. That's the challenge. It's not for us to work harder. It's not for us to be smarter. It's for us to come to God with our questions, with our concerns. Yield to him and say, God, I'm gonna believe you. Help me understand. Help me go where you want me to go. A friend of mine shared this anonymous statement with me uh, this last week. He said, the man with an experience is not at the mercy of the man with an argument. The man with an experience is not at the mercy as the, of the man with an argument. That doesn't mean that you check your brains at the door. I know doing a, a message like this kind of, kind of may, might make you think, gosh, you know, He's just thrown out all reason. We're not doing that at all. But what we're saying is, every worldview has questions it cannot answer well. Everyone. But I can tell you that the Christian worldview answers the, the, the reason for where evil comes from better than any others. One worldview will tell you it's an illusion. It's not really there. Christianity says, you know what? Evil in the world is a result of sin. And when sin entered into the world, it ruined everything that God had planned for us. But God loved us so much that he became flesh. He took all of our sin on himself. They nailed him to a cross and he hung there, bearing the cost, the price for our sin. Now, it wasn't just his physical death, but it was in some way some sort of separation between Jesus, God the Son, and God the Father. And when he hung on that cross, he paid for your sin and mine. I don't care. It doesn't really matter what I think. God doesn't care. What sin has come to your mind even just now? You come to Christ, you put your faith and trust in him, he will forgive that sin and he will make you a new person. Sin is the problem. We don't like to talk about sin nowadays. 
Nobody wants to tell someone else they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing. We want to be tolerant. My concern is that we're going to tolerate so much. We'll never tell someone the truth. And if somebody doesn't know they're sick, they will never know they need to be made well. So Jesus, perfect son of God, nailed to a tree for sins he did not commit so that the sins we did commit can be forgiven. And he can reconcile us to God and reconcile us to each other. So there you have it, the choice. Lay yourself, your reputation, your life, your eternity in the hands of a carpenter turned rabbi who died for your sins, rose from the dead, and risked being labeled a fool. Or, choose the wisdom of this world, wisdom that seems so wise, but from God's point of view is the epitome of foolishness. I want to make this challenge a little bit more practical. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. I've got a card that I'm going to have them pass down each of the aisles. And on this card, there are four simple responses. So as, as soon as you guys get those, come on up and start handing those down the aisle. One of those four responses, as you see them on, on the, the screen, is A, no, I don't buy it. You haven't convinced me of anything. I think you're foolish. That's valid. B, I'm intrigued, but I have questions. You know, I don't expect that in, in one message anyone is going to cross the line of faith. It, it may happen. It used to happen all the time. But nowadays, we want to think about it. We want to talk about it. We want, to, we want to challenge it, and we welcome that. So I'm intrigued, but I have questions. Maybe your response would be C. This is what I've been looking for. My life has been a mess, and I know there's an emptiness inside of me, and I, I'm, I'm going to come to God and ask him to fill that. Or D, I'm already a fool for Christ, and I want to just say amen. Thank you for the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So as these cards come down, there are pens in the pew in front of you. Go ahead and quickly uh, mark down what your response would be, A, B, C, or D. And then as you do that, if you would like to talk about it, if you want to maybe have some of your questions um, uh, discussed with you, then I would, I would ask you to give me your contact information, and we'll, we will give you a call. We'll shoot you an email, shoot you a text, whatever, whatever method of contact that you most prefer so that we can talk about and deal with some of the questions and some of the issues that might be hold, still holding holding you back. Now, if you're here and you've said, you know what, I've, been, I've had my questions answered and I, I'm, I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus. In just a moment, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And if you want to put your faith and trust in Christ, you can do that right here, right now. Pray with me. If you want to put your faith and trust in Christ, you can just say these words along with me or you can pray your own prayer. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my sin caused you to be nailed to the cross. I'm sorry for what I've done. But I want to thank you for dying in my place. Right now, I put my, my faith, I put my life, I put my everything in your hands as I confess my sins to you and I ask you to forgive me. I invite you to come into my life and be my friend, but also be my Lord. Begin changing me as you promised you would so that I can be like Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.